This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. Good evening, boys and girls, scholars and laymen, ladies and gentlemen, to the woke, the wokish, the sleep, the sheeple, and everybody else, all of humanity. This is your brother Ron, also known as R2C2 H2 the Artivist. Welcome to another wonderful, infotaining, edutaining edition of The Artivist Thinks. And I hope y'all thinking out there. I am a thought provocateur. So I want to thank everybody over the last several days for sending in their donations, their support. I've been overwhelmed with the wonderful words of encouragement and also financial support. And people tell me, Brother Ron, we want to hear from you. Uh, can you please tell us some things, uh, your perspective of what's going on? So I want to honor that. I want to thank you all for supporting me because y'all just don't know, man. Uh, I still have bills to pay like everybody else. And really what I'm doing is a labor of love. I never made real money off of this. But at the same time, you got the feds, the IRS. They don't care about people unless you are people according to what the U.S. Supreme Court says a person, which is uh, Amazon or Walmart or, uh, you know, a Netflix. They don't pay taxes, General Electric, Electric and all that stuff. But you have somebody like Joe Lewis who gave free boxing exhibitions for Uncle Sam and gave a million dollar donation to Uncle Sam, the government, and they still destroyed Joe Lewis. And he was an army veteran. And we're going to talk about this right now because people have been asking me what's going on, what's my thoughts on what's, how America is burning. America is, is, is turning into one big Charlottesville. America is one big Charlottesville from sea to shiny sea. This is how I feel about the situation. I've been looking at my social media. I don't look at uh, corporate mind control news. I'm not into the CNN, the MSNBC, the Fox News. I'm not into all of that. But what happened is I, I encounter people in my daily uh, going on ons in life who are into that. Because everybody, whether we know it or not, we're walking billboards for ideologies, ideas, and other forms of propaganda. Like whatever you consume in terms of your TV, in terms of your music, in terms of your food, we become a walking billboard and advertising for it. A lot of folks think that we're practicing free will. That's not the case. You know, we think, but we all are on, under some type of programming. Tell you lies vision. Tell you lie vision. Television. Tell a lie vision. Programming. Programming. Indoctrination. Indoctrination. All right. For the nation, you know, uh, white noise that puts you all to sleepy weepy. So I just want to share my thoughts. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of videos, but I just want to make sure I put one video out there because there's so much going on. Uh, the narrative constantly changes, but the, the facts remain that black lives do not matter in the system that does not value humanity. Think about it. You got a you know, man, you got mankind, kind of a man ish, Jewish, bluish, blackish. But what is the truth? Truthish? You know, but I want to applaud people who are upset and they use their anger in a constructive matter. It is very much possible to be angry and not be self destructive. Let me repeat this. This has been like everybody, be, well, you, if you anger, anger will consume you. No, you could be angry and use it as a way to get focus and discipline about the things you want out of life, how to manifest certain things. Think about Kobe. Kobe uses anger as a form of passion to focus, 
to become that mamba mentality. You know, the focus, that anger. It's like uh, Duke Ellington. This is Black Music Month, right? This is National Black Music Month. It's like with Duke Ellington when he was asked, uh, Duke, does it bother you that, you know, you headline a, a venue, but you can't come through the front door? You can't stay at the hotels. You got to walk through the kitchen. And basically, Duke said something to the fact that, uh, well, sir, I take all that anger and I go write some blues. And Duke <laughs> did a lot of recordings. He wrote maybe, some people say, 3,000 songs all together and arrangements and recordings and movie scores and all types of stuff he did. So basically, Duke let you know he was an angry black man. Same thing with Coltrane. You know, Coltrane, you listen to John Coltrane, very distinctive saxophone sound, a lot of energy. They call it the walls of sound. Listen to Giant Steps. He just playing chords upon chords, notes upon notes, and people would assume he was angry, but his thing was he was not necessarily angry, but he trying to find ways to express what is urgent. It's like what Dr. King said, the fierce urgency of now. He'll try to find ways to express all these ideas all these feelings and emotions, trying to get it out there to the world in rapid time. And so we are right now in the fierce urgency of now. And I want my people to stop doing the same stuff over and over and expecting a different result. You know what I'm talking about. We're not going to be able to sing, to march, to pray, or forgive our way out of what's happening now. This is the zeitgeist. It's the spirit of the time. There's a paradigm shift happening right now in real, real time. It's now the time to put stuff on the line. And 2020 is hindsight. It's crystal clear. It's a focus, laser focus. Uh, people are being exposed. People are being exposed. You are finally realizing who the people around you are, you know, because the quarantine forced a lot of us to deal with each other and our own issues, our own traumas, our own whatever. He has forced us to reveal the person behind the mask, whether it be your loved ones, uh, strangers, co-workers, even yourself. You're finally understanding who you are if you're smart and aware and you open to learning you're understanding that and your relationship with people and the system so this is a hard reset on many different levels uh what paul mooney said it's the wake up call right you know i'm talking about with paul mooney comedian this is your wake up call so this is our wake up call it's time for black folks to wake up to reality there's no way you can hide from destiny. And what's interesting is that you see the young people. But black leadership is MIA. Traditional so-called black leadership is MIA. And this is where black leaders are made. This type of situation, crisis create opportunity. Crisis create opportunity. So where are the opportunities when it comes to black leadership? I have noted, you know, and I could be wrong. The Nation of Islam is very quiet right now. Minister Farrakhan. And I could be wrong, but I get Google alerts about Minister Farrakhan. I have not necessarily been checking in on that. But, you know, we're approaching, what, the 20th anniversary? I mean, not the 20th, excuse me. And it's the 25th anniversary of the Million Man March coming up. From 1995, you know, over several million people showed up and, and crowded DC during the weekday, but you know, five years ago we had the what the means more justice or else movement. I attended that one. I attended the justice justice or else movement back in October of 2015, and uh, it was held on the weekend. It was more like a uh, it's more infotainment. You know, it wasn't you know because Farrakhan walked back the ten thousand. He said he wanted 10,000 soldiers, right, allegedly, and he walked that back. And what people got to understand by Farrakhan, Farrakhan is not a revolutionary, not like Malcolm was. Malcolm was a real revolutionary who, you know, he was a religious figure, but he was more so a revolutionary than Minister Farrakhan or Elijah Muhammad were, or was, rather. I mean, Minister is still around. Minister is a great symbol 
but he's like kind of like you know you look at queen elizabeth he's insulated you know what i'm saying he got all the security all the uh comfortable trappings of you know being a religious figure in his field you know he's very comfortable he's very well protected very well taken care of majority of black people in this country think about chicago how black folks are being done in chicago Think about how black folks are being done in Baltimore and Memphis and all over the place. We don't have the same luxuries of a honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan. And I'm not saying he did not, he has not done good work over his years of living, almost 90 years of living. And I wish him many more years of living, but uh, you should Google or go to YouTube and look at the critique of one of our esteemed ancestors, righteous ancestors, brother, Dr. John Henry Clark, who critiqued Minister Farrakhan and the Million Man March just not too long after it happened. This is back in 95. And I thought it was brave on his part to come out against Minister on that because basically marches, what, what has marching or parades or speeches ever solved anything for black people? Like even go back to the 63 March on Washington where Malcolm was a witness. He called the farce on Washington. Then you really think about it, it was just a parade, a march to uh, increase minimum wage. It was about jobs and freedom. It wasn't really about black people. And Dr. King was not a key organizer. He was allowed the opportunity to speak his mind. The I Have a Dream speaks where people you know, want to talk about the dream. But really he was talking about the American nightmare, the check coming back, bouncing insufficient funds. This is what Brother Ron and we all become in. We're reclaiming the narrative. And I'm blessed that I have a platform that have been built blood, sweat, tears, and years, and that some of you all respect me enough uh, to take this information and disseminate it among your networks. I'm all about the mailman theory. You don't follow the mailman around on his route. You go to the mailbox, get the mail intended for you, go through the mail, throw away the junk mail, keep the mail that's pertinent to you, your survival, your success, whatever, and then run with that. Don't worry about if the, the mailman is a crackhead, if he's sleeping with crack whores, if he's a uh, crystal meth, if he's beating his wife, if he's abusing his children. Now, that's wrong, but that's not your concern when it comes to the message. Forget about the messenger and receive and accept the message and do what you will with that. So I hope that 2020 will let us as a people, particularly black people, stop worshiping false idols. Stop worshiping celebrities. They made deals, man. They're not who you think they are. Nobody is really, everybody wears masks. We wear the mask. Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, people like w, w. Dr. E.B. Du Bois talk about, you know, the double consciousness of black folk and the souls of black folk. But what I'm saying is, stop being in love with these celebrities. These weaponized celebrities are meant to serve an agenda of distraction and deflection. They're not there to liberate our people. You can't name a time... When a celebrity, I could give you a few exceptions, and they paid the price for it. People like Paul Robeson paid a price for it. We forget about Paul Robeson. But before Malcolm, he came up with the idea to bring up civil, uh, human rights and civil rights charges, violations against uh, black Americans before the United Nations. That was Paul Robeson. Look up the term menticide. They came up with that term menticide to bring up charges against the United States of human rights violations of black Americans and Paul Robeson spoke out around the world he was a true humanitarian as I as I do this you know recording this is I believe Muhammad Ali died on this day four years ago if I'm not mistaken Muhammad Ali died and that was an archivist he was like a Paul Robeson at the height of his prominence heavyweight champion of the world the youngest at that time to achieve that achievement he spoke out against the war in Vietnam. And the crazy thing about it was that Muhammad Ali was not going to face any action on the front line. At best, he would have been like a mascot and would have been doing some boxing exhibitions. He would have been there for morale, but he refused to go along with the go-along. Like he said, no Vietcon ever called him, you know, that word. That word, that word, that word, that word. It's so whatever. But... <clears throat> He lost four years, basically, of his prime. I mean, he came back, made, had an amazing career. 
after he came back, but he lost four years of his prime basically standing up for what is right. And I guess now history is validating Colin Kaepernick. He's no Muhammad Ali. In my opinion, he's no Paul Rosen. Now these are facts. He's not he's not them, but he's the closest that we got in this day and age where he took that knee. Now some people believe he took a knee because he got benched, whatever. It was more like a, a career PR stunt to bring more awareness to him and to keep his names in the press. But the universe soul God has a way of utilizing people beyond their own understanding. So Colin Kaepernick has been proven correct, if that's true, that he was like acknowledging police brutality. But a lot of people, they still sidetrack. Like you got Drew Brees down there talking about he can't stand for anybody to disrespect the flag or the country. Because, you know, guess what? The country was made for you and not to me. This land is not my land. It's your land, white man. And really, it is my land. But that's another. But what I'm saying is, why would Drew Brees have a problem with America? The way it is. It benefits him. And people that look like him. Versus people that look like me. We built this thing. We built this country. On blood, sweat and tears. Not on rock and roll. But we created rock and roll. God bless the soul of Little Richard. Okay. Because he was reminding folks. We started it. We started this. I started this. My people built this. So my, be my people built this country. It's like. I didn't want to talk about stuff right now, but it's funny to me that you got people out here telling black folks we're not American enough, we're not civilized, but we the creators of civilization. We built this country. My people been on here longer than the folks who call themselves America. You got folks who folks just came over here off the boat, Ellis Island, out these different places. Folks ain't been on here 20 years or 50 years, they running everything. And now we talking about, we just uh, observed Memorial Day. Right, we're honoring folks who died in the war, people who lost their lives for ideas, principles, also people who lost their lives for multinational corporations and banksters and for all the wrong reasons. Because you know, um, man, you like Charles Hamilton Houston, who was the dean of Howard University Law School, who was the Jagna. For D. Thurgood Marshall, who was the architect for what eventually became Brown v. Board before the U.S. Supreme Court. He died in 1950, and that came about four years later. But he trained the folks that end up trying that case before the Supreme Court. Uh, he was the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review. And also, he was a World War I veteran. He was a lieutenant in World War I, but he was almost lynched in full uniform. Because the white French girls preferred the black guys in uniforms versus the white man. The American doughboys almost lynched this man who was an officer in his uniform. You understand what I'm saying? And so they, he had an epiphany after serving in World War I. You know, he said, I'm going to come back and fight the war at home. Here I am fighting to make the world safe for democracy. And yet I'm not safe at home. My family are not safe. My family members are not safe at home. You had World War One veterans coming home being lynched in full uniform. Like that famous NAACP uh, flag outside their offices in New York. A man was lynched yesterday. You know, black folks getting lynched every day, day and a half in this country at one point. And we're still getting killed in mysterious ways. Because we're magical Negroes. Right? Uh, think about Sandra Bland. Think about so many other people. Traffic stop turns into a death sentence. You understand what I'm saying? That's for being black in this thing. So they've been happening for decades and years and centuries um, in this country. What did I do to be so black and blue? Even speaking of that song, that Fess Waller's, like a, like a Fess Waller protest song. What did I do to be so black and blue? I could tell by a story. I'm in Memphis, and I'm not that far away from Bill Street. I could tell you a story about Louis Armstrong. He came to Memphis for a concert back in 1931. And uh, I believe what happened, he was sitting next to his manager's wife, who was a white woman. And the uh, Memphis Police Department did not like that. So they, they arrested him and his band. And Lewis was like, you know, he's from New Orleans. He know about the police about, you know, what they about. He remembered the old timers, the elders talking about the Robert Charles riots of 1900. Well, it was a black man from Mississippi named Robert Charles. 
uh, July 23rd to 27th, he led a race war. He ignited a race war because the police were trying to do, trying to kill him, and he defended himself. So that led to a race war. You had white folks from all across Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Georgia coming to New Orleans. That's what they call coon hunting. They're shooting black folks. They didn't care if you're old or young or woman or child. They would go around terrorizing black folks in New Orleans, burn down the black neighborhoods in New Orleans, looking for Robert Charles. And they finally did get Robert Charles that mutilated his body. But before he went, he took out several police officers. Some of New Orleans finest. And white folks couldn't believe that a black man fought back. You know, even though they killed him and lynched him horribly and disfigured him, the white folks, especially the old line Confederates, had a lot of respect for Robert Charles. See, they respect, they'll kill you, but they, they respect you more when you fight back. Now this hands up, don't shoot. But when you fight back with hands up, we'll shoot. You know what I'm saying? I, and I'm just saying, this is history. I'm not promoting anything. This happened over a hundred years ago. And he was a folk hero in the black community. But what happened to him was the reason why they were able to get him eventually was because the, you had a snitch in the neighborhood. It was a guy, a black dude in the neighborhood, snitched to the white folks, told them where Robert Charles was hiding in this house, I believe on Saratoga Street, if not mistaken, because I don't got my notes in front of me. But y'all gonna crucify y'all crucify our brother to get one fact wrong. I can have a lot of things right. I get the name wrong, uh, the enunciation uh, or whatever of uh, the name or whatever date or year off. But the Irishman, it, it cost two hundred million dollars to make, and Martin Scorsese got all types of dates and years and, and facts wrong in that thing. And y'all said it was a masterpiece. It's just flawless. You know that's how we do each other. But he snitched to the white folks. They told you know. They, they smoked out Robert Charles. They set the house on fire. But Robert Charles took a couple more with him. He was shooting through that crowd. And finally, uh, I believe a 19-year-old white medical student climbed a tree and just sniped him out. And they dra dragged his body and they did their thing. But he was a folk hero. And what happened to the snitch, unlike Takashi 69 another brother smoked the snitch just days later on his porch. I believe he was reading the newspaper. And a black cat came up and they smoked him. You know what I'm saying? But Robert Charles was a folk hero for the black community in New Orleans. He was such a folk hero that they wrote a song called The Ballad of Robert Charles. It was very popular among jazz and blues musicians. But uh, according to Jelly Roll Morton, the lyrics were forgotten about because it, it pissed off the white patrons at the clubs and the bars. They didn't want to hear that crap about Robert Charles. But it's a great book written by a, a former LSU professor. He's deceased now, William Ivy Hare called the carnival of fury that's the carnival of fury so you had a, a thing where a black man took his life in his own hands he knew that he was a dead man walking before they took him out he took a lot with him he took several police officers with him and wounded 20 plus people so yeah um this is why we all be we we all beaten i don't think nobody else really talking about robert charles i'm gonna give you an example through history all right and i'm gonna come back and do some more shows just keep on supporting what we're doing here because I mean, I, I, I appreciate y'all so much. I got to keep on feeding my people. Baba Dick Gregory, anointed me as the feeder. I must feed you all. Uh, I have a lot to offer everybody, but if I can uh, have time and space to record this information, to disseminate it, uh, whether it be through my art, you know, by art of his art, where it, that's my Nipsey Hustle shirt. I did hip hopacy, like prophecy, but hip hopacy. All right, that's my dedication, Nipsey. You could buy that. Teespring below shelf. Click on that. Got more to come. Artwork R2C2H2.com or you can just cash app dollar sign R2C2H2. PayPal email R2C2H2 at gmail.com and Venmo is uh, at R2C2H2. So you see how it works. So Robert Charles. But also, you have black men who survived. Cause a lot of y'all got that queen and slim mentality. Y'all fear that if y'all stand up, y'all can't live to see another day. And that's not true. Uh, there's a case that happened in Holmes County, Mississippi, just a little bit over a year before Emmett Till was a, a lynch in Mississippi. This brother who was a World War II veteran named Eddie Knoll. Eddie Knoll. That's N-O-E-L. Eddie Knoll uh, got into a shootout. One of the largest manhunts in the state of Mississippi history they don't even talk about this. I have met so-called civil rights historians 
and all types of black historians, they never heard of this story. And the only reason I heard about this story is because it was a white dude from that era who was a teenager when this incident happened uh, named Ali Povel. He wrote a book called The Time of Eddie Knoll. It's called The Time of Eddie Knoll. We interviewed him. And it was interesting because my sister actually purchased this book at a bookstore closing. And I, you know, I didn't know she purchased it, but I was in her room or something in the book. I always tell people, you don't choose books. Books choose you. So that book was just staring back at me. He had a picture of a young Eddie Knoll on the cover. And it's called The Time of Eddie Knoll. And so I started reading it. It was a quick read because it was so amazing. Uh, it's unbelievable. Like I always tell people, black history is better than science fiction on any Hollywood movie. If they just can tell the truth about our people, they ain't have to fabricate anything about Harriet Tubman. They ain't have to fabricate and make BS about Madam C.J. Walker. They could just told the truth about these people. Because if you tell the truth about our people, it's hard to believe. So I don't fault the white people to think that we're magical Negroes. We're magic, but if you shoot us, we will bleed and die. Yes, we're magical. We are the soul people. We're the chosen ones. But if you shoot us, if you stab us, we will bleed. Okay? 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 Y'all got like to do because y'all like, y'all just hypnotized with that stuff. But Eddie Noel was a World War II veteran, right? He had sniper ability. That man was a, a crack shot. Like, you know, he's a country boy. You know, he just hunts for his dinner, squirrels, all that stuff. That boy could shoot like nobody's business. He was a, a prodigy when it came to shooting that rifle, right? Uh, I think the first weekend of the new year of 1954, his wife was working at a juke joint uh, owned by a white guy. And everybody know, including Eddie, I believe, that she was screwing the white man, the owner of the juke joint. And so Eddie went to retrieve her from her job at the juke joint to take her back home. The white man was a big bully. See, Eddie Noel was a short dude. I don't think he was 5'2", maybe. Maybe he was 5'4", five, 5'2", five, something like that. And this guy was very imposing. So he basically manhandled and disrespected Eddie Noel in front of his woman as well as other clients. You know, people that was patrons of the, of the juke joint. You know, he was roughing it up, threatening his life and everything. So I think Eddie went to retrieve his rifle, shot him. Shot, I think the club owner daddy shot the sheriff deputy. He didn't shoot the sheriff, but he did kill the sheriff deputy. Oh no. So he went, went on the run after that, right? He went on the run. You know, he shot the, the club owner that was screwing his wife, the juke joint owner that was screwing his wife, killed him, killed the sheriff deputy. I think he wounded the dad of the juke joint owner and he went on the run. So over the next couple of weeks, during the ice storm, no less, you had a thousand white men armed to the T with, with dogs and rifles and knives looking for Eddie Noel in the middle, in the, in the middle of a winter storm, an ice storm. Not just a winter storm, but an ice storm. And he was hiding in the woods and he could actually see people, the white folks looking for him. Here's the thing. That's why, you know, you got to call it self-defense because he could have easily killed a whole bunch of white people if he wanted to, but he did not. He could actually see him while they were looking for him in the woods. They couldn't see him. But he did, you know, and some he did engage in some instances with the white folks looking for him, the white man with the dogs and the guns. And uh his thing was he released that trigger finger. He was a he was like, you know how Patrick Mahomes throw a football? That's how fast he was with his trigger finger. He was basically a human machine gun. He scared the hell out of the white people. He scared the hell out of because he'd be shooting at them sometimes. But he, if he wanted to kill them, he could have killed them. But he was a shooting team to scare them. And what's interesting about him and about that event, that phenomenon, is the fact that you had black and white families in the area that sympathized, that empathized with Eddie Noel. They were taking turns hiding him in their barn houses giving him food so he had the support of black and white folks in the community although he killed several white men the white folks knew that he got screwed over by that juke joint owner and he deserved his fate because he was defending himself and his honor so eventually eddie noel turned himself in to a white friend of his family now this is a black man he's a mulatto high yellow whatever you want to call him he's high yellow he's a short guy 
but one of his family friends happened to be this white man that he trusted. So he turned himself in to the white man who delivered him to the authorities in Jackson, I believe. And they put him in a mental institute. You got to think about it. Black folks were not allowed to testify against white people back in the 50s. We were not even allowed to register the vote. I'm talking about in Mississippi, as far as Mississippi concerned. If there's one thing about the vote, uh, I don't think it's the best answer for black folks at this time. I'll be honest with you because the, the candidates uh, and a lot of the people leave a lot to be desired. And we can't keep on saying we got to vote for the lesser evil. Simply for the fact that evil is evil. Whether you kill one person or, and, and, or you kill 20 people, murder is murder. It's like, you know, it's like saying voting for the lesser evil is like saying, well, I want to, you can either vote for Lucifer or Satan. Same person, different name. Evil is evil. But, you know, since black folks were now allowed to register during that time in Mississippi, then you could get black folks on a jury. You can get a jury of your peers to try you on life and death stuff. So, like, the fact that, you know, white, you know, black folks were not known to testify at these trials, especially when it concerns white people either being killed by black folks or white folks killing black people. You know, year over a year later, you got the Emmett Till thing. Uh, the brothers uh, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant was tried and you had Emmett's great uncle Mose Wright be courageous and point them out. There they be. There they be in a photograph uh, done and captured by the late Ernest Withers, the so-called FBI informant, but prolific civil rights photographer. So I said, I was going to say, so this is 1954 Mississippi. So they put them in a mental institute because they said it's unusual for a black person to fight back. But you know, in that time period, they would put you in mental institutions or in prison if you look a white person in the eye. You can look a white person in the eye and they'll put you in mental institutions. Because it's strange. Why this Negro got the audacity? He must be crazy. Uh, if you see a kid, a white kid walking the sidewalk, it was custom for black folks. You could be 85 years old. You could be, you, could, you know what I'm saying? You could be old, you know, an elder, but they call you a boy. You got to get out off the sidewalk for the white people to pass, even if it's a kid. This is the mentality. Like we does, we do ourselves a disservice. When we don't talk about these type of stuff. The trauma, man, that's transferred from generation and generation living with these savages. Yeah, I said it's savages, man. It's crazy. Why do we want to be around people that don't want to be around us? They were trying to do us, I believe, a a, a, a favor. See, we keep on thinking that Jim Crow and segregation was about treating black folks inferior. In reality, it was about white folks understanding to me that they were a virus that can't be helped and that they're vicious and they're dangerous. Everywhere they go on the planet, they destroy stuff. They destroy ecosystems everywhere. You know, everywhere. Australia, that was a prison colony. Look how they decimated the aboriginal people. Everywhere they go, they bring havoc. Every holiday, hell day, is based on some type of violent act that they initiated. Think about Columbus Day. What did he do? Uh, he discovered new world or new, new, new uh, ass and titties. What did he do? He was raping people, spreading diseases, killing folks, slaughtering people. Never made it to mainland, mainland North America, but he's credited with discovering America, even though you had people already here. People that look like you and I, if you're black, already here. Okay, so we're doing with this stuff. Let me go back. I know I dropped all over the place. Let me go back. So they put this guy in a mental institution, and uh, he never went to trial. And really, you'd be surprised if he would be able to, to make it to trial. Because normally, they'll lynch a black man for less. You know, how did he get away with that? Well, you know, they were going to perform... I believe a lobotomy on him, you know, you know, you know, scrambling his brain to make him more compliant and passive, less aggressive. And what happened was the white side of his family intervened on his behalf. See, you, you got to understand, Eddie Noel was named after Edmund Noel, who was a governor of Mississippi. So his family had clout. The white part of his family intervened. They saved his life. He didn't get a lobotomy. He spent some years, you know, institutionalized, but he got out, died an old man in Indiana, 
back in 1994. Why they don't talk about these stories? He survived the encounter. He fought back and he lived to be an old man. Eddie Knoll. Read the book, The Time of Eddie Knoll. This happened a little bit over a year before Emmett Till. And you think about it. What they were thinking about. You know, you meet this guy. According to Emmett Till, was very uh, cocky, confident from Chicago. They had a white girlfriend back home. Uh, then it dealt with some homegrown guy named Eddie Knoll who dared to defend himself, his honor, and kill a white man. And get away with it. So you got to think about the mindset. Oh, no. We ain't going to have no more Eddie Knowles. Emmett got to go. Emmett must die. See what I'm saying? But nobody talks about the Eddie Knowles stuff that happened before. Or we talk about Robert F. Williams. And there's a, a video interview he did. Just right before he died. Maybe several years before he died. And it's worth watching. It is so much. It's worth the 28 minutes of watching. And he talks about. How he wanted Monroe, North Carolina, where he's from, to be uh, the Mount Vernon of the black liberation struggle. Because he saw himself as a general. He was a World War II veteran in the Marines. You know, it's another Army vet trained in martial arts. Started his own rifle club. Was the president of the local NAACP down in Monroe, North Carolina. North Carolina back in the 50s and 60s was a powerful stronghold for the Ku Klux Klan. So they wasn't playing. He came from the same hometown as Jesse Helms, the racist Senator Jesse Helms. You know, they ran against Harvey Gantt. You know, you're talking about Michael Jordan uh, back, you know, Michael Jordan's last dance. Now, Michael Jordan released a statement about uh, Floyd, right? George Floyd. But back then he said, you know, he couldn't endorse Harvey Gantt, a black man running against Jesse Helms Jr. because Republican buy shoes. Now he's talking about George Floyd and all that. You know, think about the stuff that's going on. But anyway, Jesse Ham's father was Jesse Ham Sears, who was at one point not only the police chief, but also the fire chief in Monroe, North Carolina. So this is the environment that Robert, uh, Robert F. Williams come from. He said, we got into the shootouts with the Klan, police. I mean, they confronted police. They pulled guns on police. They got into shootouts with these people, and they survived. Nobody died. Nobody died, right? Nobody died. He lived to be an old man. He died of leukemia at the age of 70. Rosa Parks did his eulogy in Monroe, North Carolina, where he's buried back in October of 96, I believe. But he didn't die. He didn't lose nobody. Matter of fact, um, he wrote a book called Negroes with Gun. He advocated self-defense and fighting back if necessary. But he was saying that he wanted Monroe to be Mount Vernon. He saw himself like a George Washington founding father figure. And he was talking about how George Washington lived to be, you know, old man. He was able to retire, right? He fought the good fight, won the Revolutionary War, served his country as the first president under that constitution, <clears throat> under that constitution, right? Served two terms, retired to Mount Vernon. So when they teach white kids that story, it's like, oh, he fought against the man. He fought the powers that be. He won. He lived, you know, his life, he, you know, he was celebrated. But you think about, like you said, you drive around the country, you got kids ask their mom about Malcolm X Boulevard, Dr. King Boulevard, you got streets and colleges named after Malcolm X, Dr. King, Mega Evers, and like, you know, you respect our, our ancestors, but at the same time, it's like they're putting the message in a young black mind that, boy, if you step out of line, we won't let you make it to 40. You know, we lost Mega Evers, another World War II veteran, members of the, a member of the Red Ball Express. They're kind of like the Amazon Prime truck drivers or whatever, or FedEx truck drivers of World War II. They was you know, making sure that uh, General George Patton and his third army had all their supplies, food, ammunition, all that stuff. So my grandfather, uh, the late Arthur Taylor Sr., was also a member of the Red Ball Express. He, he was there you know, during the D-Day invasion along with Mega Evers. I don't know if they knew, the, knew each other or whatever, or they was in the same company. But they were doing that for his Uncle Sam. Because we fought in every war for this republic. The first person to die was a black man for liberation. Christmas addicts. And they try to write him out the history books, right? They try to write him out the narrative. So, uh, Robert F. Williams said that's traumatizing. That'd be traumatizing 
our black people to keep them in their place because they don't talk about Robert F. Williams. Even today, a lot of us don't know who Robert F. Williams was, the stance he took. Uh, the man ended up going to Cuba because he was wanted by the feds. Him and his wife, a sister, Mabel Williams, who passed away not too long ago, back in 2014. They're like the real Queen of Slam, but it was a revolutionary Queen of Slam. They were no joke. They were able to escape to Cuba. He did a thing called Radio Free Dixie down there, broadcasting uh, from Cuba, urging black servicemen to lead an armed insurrection while, you know, America was getting deep into the Vietnam War. Why not lead an insurrection to overthrow the system? So he was a threat, man. He ended up going to China, became a guest of the state like he was in Cuba. By him being a guest of honor of the state in China, he was able to get valuable intel that the United States government won't. So he struck a deal because the reason why they went over to Cuba and eventually China was because it was a riot that took place in his hometown. And it was this white couple that got lost. And he was trying to help the white people out, you know, let, let, let them stay in my home. Once this rioting died down, they can leave. But the authorities claim that they kidnapped the white folks, but they saved the white people's lives. But you know how it is. Pull a trigger killer. He's a hero. So they had to get out of there. So they get out of the country, you know. But they had valuable intel, invaluable intel that America wanted. The government, the State Department, the, uh, the Nixon administration wanted so he struck a deal. He was able to come back home. Charges were dismissed. He had William Kunstler as his lawyer. Charges were dismissed. He gave them the intel which led Richard Nixon, Richard Milhouse Nixon, to become the first president to visit China in United States history. He became the first U.S. president to visit China and normalize relations with China. And that's why we got the gift of the Wuhan virus. Oh, COVID, whatever. But I'm just saying, you see how that, and they don't even talk about his contribution. Matter of fact, he ended up, you know, uh, working at the uh, University of Michigan when they started, they started, uh, they started a department for him to work. And uh, but yeah, let's look at Robert F. Williams. He survived. He lived to be an old man, but his friends, like Malcolm Martin, was not allowed to get to th uh, forty. So this is why, you no, know, I talk about these things. So let's get into how I feel about what's going on you know i'm gonna do some more videos but i just want to give that information out for you all so, to know that we can fight and we can win some some battles we can even win this war but like dr king said a man ain't willing to die for anything he ain't fit to live he is he isn't fit to live that was dr king said and i'm tired of people taking dr king out of context try to talk people down like he even said that riots are the language on the, the riot is the language of the unheard and people trying to twist it like, you know, just be peaceful. Yeah, it's like, you know, be calm while they putting their knee on your neck. And the, the life is oozing out of you. But everybody got their, their, their camera phones out. Their Facebook live streaming it. on they upload it to Instagram. Everybody watching you die. It's spectator sport. Killing black people is America's pastime. It's not baseball. It's not football. It's not basketball. It's killing black people. Black lives never matter unless it was making a profit, but it does not matter to the person who possessed the black life. You understand what I'm saying? So when I saw that, that video of George Floyd, life that's oozing out of him, calling for his mama. Now we know his mama been dead for over a year. Some people say two years. I saw other sources say over a year or whatever. I guess two years. So he calling for his mama. I don't know if he's calling for his mama because he could see his mama. He could see he could see the gates of heaven, whatever, at the crossroads, whatever, right? But for a big man like that, the cry for his mama, that was so heartbreaking for me. Because I'm thinking about, damn, how many of our brothers and sisters last words were mama or Jesus or God and nobody showed up during the lynching? When they were cutting out their body parts and you know, roast them over an open fire, you know, just slow torching them, man. You know, all types of horrible, demeaning things. How many of our brothers and sisters cried out for mama or even daddy or Jesus or God? Somebody help me and nobody help. That's what's disturbing. So when you think about people doing this uh, George Floyd contest, these insistent white folks, think about those lynching photographs that they use as postcards. Think about it. It's a uh, 
it was an ex exhibition that showcased those uh, postcards. I believe the exhibition was called Without Sanctuary. I believe you can actually find the, the actual exhibition. They upload all the images online. You probably type in Without Sanctuary. I think they got a book with all the images that were showcased in that exhibition. And these white folks would take our pain and make profit out. They don't care. You know, they used to take our body parts and pickle them up and they could sell them in uh, general stores. Imagine going to like a Walmart or even Amazon online. You're able to buy Negro parts. You know what I'm saying? Pickle up Negro feet. Uh, penises, ears, noses, eyes. So, you know, let's put this in perspective, right? You had Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois who taught, I believe taught at Clark Atlanta. Some of those Atlanta University, that is Clark Atlanta now. Um, he taught down there. Du Bois, you know, lived to be almost 100 years old. Died on the eve of the march on Washington and Ghana back on August 27, 1963. But he was walking down Atlanta downtown past the store. He saw, I believe, the body parts of Sam Holes. Sam Holes was a black man, a laborer, who got into a dispute, I believe, with his uh, boss over payment that he was due. The boss attacked him from my from one uh, narrative. Alleged the boss attacked him and he killed his boss in self-defense. He allegedly raped his boss's wife, which is like, you know, it may not have ever happened. But, you know, you, you say you rape a white woman. If they say you rape a white woman, that's a death sentence during that time period. Even now, I'll be honest with you. But Sam Holes fought, killed his boss. Uh, then he was lynched by thousands of white people. I mean, they hit white folks will put notices in the newspapers. They run special trains for the lynchings. So you see those photographs. You got thousands of white people. These are not no like no creature. These were everyday professional white people. They brought their families to the picnic. You know what I'm saying? You had doctors, lawyers, uh, judges, sheriffs. You know, people. They would wear the hood, you know what I'm saying, as Klansmen. But back in those days, they were happy to smile. They cooking uh, a brother like barbecue. So they would put these notices in the newspaper of, uh, you know, it's a hanging special train running to so and so place, a special price, you know, charge of mission. You know, it's just really sad. And you got to think about, you know, people talking about black folks are savages and we ain't civilized. We, we created civilization, we the fathers and mothers of civilization. But what's not civilized to me and what's crazy is that you got law enforcement officials violating people's human and civil rights even today. That never stopped but to do extrajudicial stuff like that. That's disturbing. But we don't talk about it as black people because it's too traumatized. But we got to talk about it. And the only way the trauma stops if you stop feeding the trauma. The only way trauma stops is if we stop feeding it. We keep on passing it on because it's unresolved. We got to resolve this trauma right now. Enough is enough. To pass on that fear gene. To all be in a constant, you know, fight or flight mode. That's not normal. Well, I think black folks got hypertension. It's not just what we eat. It's that we're in a constant state of fight or flight. They don't, you're supposed to be always in a constant state of fight or flight. You need to have your body at rest. How can your body repair itself if you are in a constant state of fight or flight? If you live in a, a constant world of anxiety. Every time you see a cop car pull behind you, you open God, God, I hope it ain't me today. You know what I'm saying? You see them mics going off? You don't know if that's your last time. You understand? If that's your final ride. You don't know that. This is how serious this stuff is. But we got to know this history so we can understand how to unpack this stuff, right? So the boys saw that guy's body parts in that general store. And it really focused, himself to, it focused him to be committed, to double down on his commitment to elevate black, the black race in society. And what people say with well, Du Bois, he, he really hurt. Du Bois is arguably our greatest intellectual. He's the father of American sociology. Yeah, he had his beef with uh, Marcus Garvey, like Biggie and Tupac, like anything. It's about divide and conquer. It's always been that. And the talent and Tiff, he was correct about that. But people got to understand that the white man knew, remove the head from the body, nothing works. They do how they appropriated integration. Instead of integration, it was assimilation. Think about it. Some of my strongest institutions, Jim Crow era was the schools and the church. 
especially the schools, because you build, you know, schools and communities about neighborhood pride. You had children coming through a supportive environment. Some of the best high schools and schools in Vernon were black schools. And this is what they don't talk about. Some of the best schools in the country were black schools during Jim Crow. You got a place like uh, Dunbar High School produced some very accomplished black people in D.C. Uh, Manassas High School in Memphis, Booker T. Washington. <clears throat> you name these schools all over the country. See, Brown v. Board is misleading. You understand? Linda Brown, we just lost her maybe two years ago. And um, that was not about the school. She, the reason why the Brown case in Kansas, what that was about, she had a school closer to her home. Now, you go online and look at the black school she went to. The black school is like, it's a, you know, miles away. But the reason why they'll, they'll say, why do we got to go all the way over there when she just could go to the school in the neighborhood? And the black school she went to wasn't bad. As far as I know, but I'm saying, see, we don't understand the history. Even that, that um, I believe that, that baby doll test was uh, rigged. Some people said it was fixed. It wasn't true. That baby doll, the color test, it was a fixed type of pro But uh, you can Google all that and come to your own um, conclusion on that. You know, I'm just throwing that out there. That's what I heard. Uh, people say it was not legit, the baby doll test. So, you got all this stuff, man. That's happened. Du Bois, he knew he was used by, you know, by the system. Because towards the end of his life, on his 91st birthday in China, he said this during a speech, I believe on radio. He said, uh, all the stuff I accomplished in my country just know me and treat me as a nigga. You can look this up. It was a New York Times article. So all I have done, I'm the, you know, he was the father of American sociology, all this amazing work. I mean, he was a uh, pivotal in organizing the Pan-African Congress that led when once Africa got liberated. <coughs> he was part of that movement of liberating Africa. You know, he died in Ghana. He was a guest of honor of uh, uh, what called Kwame Nkrumah, who was a big admirer and fan of Dr. Du Bois. You understand? And look how they did the uh, Kwame Nkrumah. How the CIA destroyed uh, his government. How they ran him out. You know what I'm saying? Cornell Pro. Y'all got to study all this stuff. This is why it, it, it's an anger. It's righteous anger, man. Like if you know the history, you're going to be angry. Like James Baldwin said, to be black in America is to be in a constant rage. If you know the history, it's like for me, I'm an oddball to a lot of people. Uh, I'm single. I don't have any prospects that I know of. I don't have any children. I don't have a family. But I have dedicated half of my life, or most of my life, really to the pursuit of knowledge and also how to share this knowledge to our people. But it's a, it's a lonely existence, though, man. A lot of people can't relate because a lot of people just zone out until something happens to them. You know what I'm saying? Like Haile Selassie said before the League of Nations allegedly said, today us, when Italy invaded you know, Ethiopia said today us, but tomorrow, allegedly. And look what happened. That's back in the 30s, man. Fascism. World War II. See, even right now, these this ain't the 1960s. People come on, oh, the 60s. I mean, people just, it's so romanticized about the 60s. But really, what this reminds me of is the 1930s on steroids. Because y'all don't, we don't study our history. We don't study history. It's not taught in schools. We're a very ahistorical society. So study the 1930s. Bonus Army. Huey Long. By the way, Huey P. Newton is named for Huey Long. Huey P. Newton is from Monroe, Louisiana. The reason why his folks named him Huey was because Huey P. Long, who was the governor at the time, he started an adult literacy program to help not only white folks to read, but also black people. Because Louisiana had one of the worst illiteracy rates for adults in the country. And he changed that. So, and also, he was unusual for a uh, white southern politician. He didn't do that George Wallace stuff. He didn't do all that race card, divide and conquer stuff. He was actually about trying to raise the living uh, conditions of all people. He had a thing called the Share the Wealth Program. See, like Bernie Bros, and all you Bernie Center supporters, he ain't no real deal. Huey Long was a populist. 
that was masquerading as a Democrat. He was a real threat to, to Franklin Roosevelt to be president in 36 and 40. But uh, they assassinated him at the uh, at the State House in Baton Rouge back in September of 1935. He could have survived, actually, but the surgeons messed him over in New Orleans. And, you know, you could make what you could make. They blamed it on Dr. Carl Weiss. The doctor allegedly shot him as he confronted him over uh, disrespecting his father-in-law, who was a prominent judge, allegedly. But from my understanding, truth be told, uh, what he did, I think he punched Huey Long or slapped him or whatever. And then his bodyguards, in response, started shooting him up. You know, machine gun fire his bodyguards. Huey Long's bodyguard was carrying machine guns. And they started shooting up stuff, started ricocheting. So they probably were the ones that actually killed Huey. And what they did was... They got the gun out the doctor's car and put it on him on his person because <laughs> he didn't have no gun on him. So was, you can look all that up, but Huey Long was taken out of here. But he started to share the wealth program that uh, this is before social media, before you know internet. He had over millions of people following him around the country in the Share the Wealth Club. He wanted to create a uh, work work conditions that like maybe we work twenty or forty hours, twenty hour week work weeks. Everybody get paid. Uh, you know, he was a socialist in a way he's a populist. He wanted to limit, you know, the elite's wealth, how much they could actually accrue in terms of wealth and use uh, the the wealth uh, for the people to help improve living and working conditions for the people. He's the reason why LSU became LSU because he took on big oil in Louisiana because at one point the school children were responsible for paying for their own textbooks. But he forced Standard Oil, this Rockefeller people, to give them enough money for the state to provide free textbooks for the kids. He improved the roads, you know, able to, you know, create bridges and roads to connect the parishes. So uh, road travel became better. And he's, when he's talking about today, he's considered a villain or a madman. He's not, it's not, the truth is not told about Huey Long. You should read his book, uh, My First 100 Days in the White House, that came out posthumously because he didn't live to make the White House. You understand? They killed him. Uh, they assassinated Huey Long. So, you got Father Coughlin out in Detroit. He had, like, you know, Huey Long had, like, you know, a lot of, both Father Coughlin and Huey Long would do, like, weekly radio broadcasts, you know, whatever, you know, regular radio broadcasts. They had, like, 25 to 30 million people listening to them on a regular basis. This is before all the technology we got now. You understand? Radio. So, you also had labor unions organized. You know, Jimmy Hoffa made his bones in the 30s in Detroit. He was organizing the workers at Kroger's of all places. Before he became into, you know, a teamster, he was at Kroger's organizing the workers back in the 30s. You had, uh, you know, all the rise of fascism. You had, you know, the black shirts, you know, Mussolini, you know, the rise of Adolf Hitler over in Germany. Uh, you had a lot of things going on. The Spanish Civil War. You had a black man from America named Oliver Law. Look him up. Oliver Law was one of the leaders of the Lincoln Brigade. He got killed over there fighting for the Spaniards to be free <laughs> of all things. But, you know, black folks gave the Spain its civilization. You know, the Moors created the first university in Europe and Spain. They ruled there, what, 700, 800 years until, like, I guess, 1492. They were driven out. But I'm saying black people everywhere. So we don't even talk about Oliver Law and his sacrifice with the Lincoln Brigade, right? So it seems like I'm my older play. But, yeah, check out the 1930s, Smedley Butler. He exposed the plot by the Wall Street bankers to get rid of Franklin Roosevelt. They wanted him to replace Franklin Roosevelt as the head of the country, as the symbol, the figurehead, right? Uh, Spanley Butler was probably the most decorated Marine in U.S. history. He had two Medal of Honors. Normally, when you win one Medal of Honor, a lot of times you're dead. But he won two, one for the Boxer Rebellion in China, one for the Spanish-American War, known as the Fighting Quaker from Pennsylvania. He exposed their plot to overthrow the government, and he was dead by 1940. So read some of his stuff online, Smedley Butler. Uh, what I'm saying is we've, we've been fighting a war for a long time. And black folks fought in every war, but never got our 40 acres and a mule. Never got what was promised to us. Yet we stayed true. Lynch in uniforms. Like even back in the uh, World War II era, you had black folks being found in full uniform, lynched and killed in waterways in Mississippi. You can find them in rivers and lakes. You know, I mean, it's sad. You know what I'm saying? It was a civil rights leader named Amzie Moore who wrote the State Department about what was going on in Mississippi. And it stopped. 
or they did a better job of hiding the bodies. So you even had a brother like uh, Sergeant Isaac Woodard, brother Isaac Woodard, uh, who was blinded by a sheriff named Linwood Shaw in South Carolina. This man was coming home, a uh, World War II veteran, a sergeant, very decorated, very accomplished in the military, riding a Greyhound bus to get home in North Carolina, uh, got into it with the bus driver because he wanted to stop to use the restroom. But the bus driver called up the local police. Sheriff Linwood, Shull, and his goons came. They harassed, beating him up. Uh, and what they really did was horrible. They were using their nightsticks and everything and just poking in his eyes. They just kept on hitting him in his eyes until he woke up the next day blind in the jail cell with partial amnesia and they kept them there like they was just they didn't let them see a doctor for days finally they dropped him off at the uh, hospital found it you know found a missing person report he was missing for three weeks when they found him he could barely he possibly remember certain things and he was blinded for life because his, his globe they bashed his eyes they gouged his eyes the sheriff did that and um the NACP picked up on the story the incident happened February 12th, 1946, by the way. Like I said, he was discharged. You know, he got his uh, honorable discharge in Atlanta, making his way back home to North Carolina, ran into that trouble in South Carolina. So two years before that, you had the uh, state execution of George Steny Jr. at 14, the youngest person to die in the literature uh, in the 20th century in America. Under questionable circumstances, he was uh, found guilty of killing two white girls. But his lawyer that represented him never filed one appeal. So they killed him back in June of 44. So. Yeah, he was legally blind. Orson Welles, the filmmaker, War of the Worlds. You know that guy, Orson, one of the greatest film directors, Citizen Kane. He became so enraged about what happened to Isaac Woodard. He started doing his, you know, he had a popular radio show. Kind of like a Joe Rogan type of dude. He had this popular radio show. He started talking about it for several days. And then Harry Truman, you know, by the way, he wanted, he was about to join the Klan in Kansas City, but he didn't do it because his, uh, his benefactor, uh, Tom Pendergast, who ran the Pendergast machine, he was Catholic, you know, and the Klan didn't like Catholic. So, you know, out of respect for his benefactor who helped him become president, he did not join the Klan, but he was outraged. You know, I think he was outraged by the fact that they did this to this guy in his uniform. He had his uniform on. And they treat him like this. He just came from serving the country. Very distinguished service. To be treated like this on American soil. When you fought to make the world safe for democracy. And by a police officer. So he actually called in. The feds. You know he called the Department of Justice. Called in you know the feds to investigate what happened. They actually had a trial. But you know he was found. Him and his uh, collaborators. This is uh, Sheriff uh, Linwood Shaw Was found innocent by all white male jury because you know they won't let black folks register the vote and i'm not saying register the vote so you can vote for president i'm saying you just should register the vote so you could be available for jury duty and if you can please be on jury because so many people who were sent up the river because of the makeup of the jury not of their peers so this man was blind these folks walked. Isaac Woodard um, died in 1992 at the age of 73. And Linwood Shaw, the sheriff, who didn't face any jail time, didn't face any type of retribution uh, for what he did to this, this war hero, this American hero. He died several years after him at the age, I believe, I want to say 95. He died at 95 years old. This cracker was able to live to be almost a century old. With no consequences. So this ain't new black America. Like you know George Zimmerman. Uh, Darren Wilson. All these folks. They have been killing black people. And getting away with impunity. Wearing the badge. This ain't nothing new. So people say. Well why nobody didn't get Zimmerman. I said why nobody didn't get Linwood Shaw. Why he was able to live to be almost a century old. You understand what I'm saying. This mentality we have. Where we so quick to kill each other. We step on somebody's Jordans. Or whatever. And we think we somebody have disrespected us a word but we don't have all this we don't have nothing for these these demons they are sucking our lives away we have nothing for them you can look at somebody getting stumped out by these demons and they work in packs the wolf pack they come in because they by themselves they scared but they, they come in packs 
Like Pac said, you ain't nothing about you ain't nothing without your home without your homeboys. You ain't nothing without your homeboys. So they come in packs, they attack in packs, they cowards, cause they can't feast you man up. You understand what I'm saying? So we always want to make excuses about why we didn't do anything. And like people harassing that sister. Thank God that she recorded that. And she was just 17 years old, but people harassing her online about why you couldn't do more. We don't look. A lot of us, like I said, fear, fights or flight, anxiety. A lot of us worry about if I do something, who's going to step up when I die? Evidently, we don't help each other back. But what's going to have to start to change? We got to get back to that Black Panther mentality where we supervise and monitor the police. Somebody need to create an app, you know, uh, reach out to the local Black Militia or Rifle Club saying, look, uh, I want to pull over. Let's say police, you know, you know, speed, high speed chase, whatever. Like the brother Sean Reed, who was a veteran in the military who got killed on Facebook Live by the police. Then they joking about like a dead, uh, like a closed casket home. And you know, there was a black man that said that BS, a black cop. And I ain't gonna get into that. Some of my worst experiences have been with black officers of the law, not with the white ones. And I had some run ins. I had, look, I had my stories. I got my traumas. So what I'm saying is. Is that you should have an app. Somebody should create an app to contact the local black rifle club or militia and saying, look, you know, something, a phone number. Look, uh, I'm being uh, followed by the police. They want to pull me over, but I'm afraid to pull over because I think something might happen to me. I'm not comfortable. And so they, you know, you have some rifle club or black militia person come out and supervise the encounter. Supervise it. And if it looks funny, you do what you got to do. Cause you have a right to defend yourself. That's just a. It's not a law, but it's just a. It's, it's your right by your creator. You have a right to make sure you survive. You have a right to um protect yourself, man. That's just natural. Any species, you just don't give yourself away. Make them earn it. You know, don't make don't make yourself an easy target. Make them earn it. And that's all I'm gonna say. But what I'm saying is we got to start thinking like that. Like a beehive mentality where we just, you know, we just swarm like they be swarming. Have a Mexican standoff, man. Uh, if it needs to, but it should never. I just like, I don't trust people. They talk all that. They rip, I mean, look, you know, Ferris, Ferris said something about 10,000, right? He said you need, we need 10,000. He walk it back. Well, Malcolm Wanted to go out to the LAPD for killing the Nation of Islam Secretary Ronald Stokes. Malcolm was gangster, man. Malcolm was like, man, Malcolm was for fans with Bobby Johnson. But that BS, uh, Godfather Harlem, don't trust it. Research it. You know, talk to people that knew Malcolm, that work with Malcolm, knew Bumpy. A lot of them, uh, if they still around. There's some people still around. Uh, but hurry fast, because playtime is over. But Malcolm wanted to go to L.A., and engaged in guerrilla warfare with the LAPD over the death of Ronald Stokes, who was a Korean War veteran. You see the thing? You know, I'm going to do another video because I got to go to work. But you see the thing? You got veterans being targeted by the state, by police. Black men put their lives on the line. Being targeted by their own hometown people. So Ronald Stokes got killed like he was nobody. Malcolm wanted to retaliate. Elijah said, no, Brother Malcolm. No, Brother Malcolm. We are a religious organization. See, that's the thing. Farrakhan is a religious leader. He's not a military leader. He's not a guerrilla tactics leader. He's a religious leader. It's comfort food. You know, different than Bishop T.D. Jakes. You know, black folks, we so emotional. Um... It's time to study some military science. And uh, a lot of times we got to have entertainment. We just, we ain't going to study, study. We got to have entertainment. Entertainment, we got to say it in a colorful way. But it's no disrespect. I'm just saying that you don't go to war with no minister. You go to war if he's a minister of defense. You know, but you don't go to war. You're not going to go to war with nobody. You know what I'm saying? In a church like that. But we had some, some religious leaders who also were revolutionaries. Uh, I could walk that back or they had a religious fervor about revolution. You think about Nat Turner was a preacher. Uh, Harriet Tubman was a preacher. 
Even John Brown was very much a Christian. He was into that religion. I believe he was a minister. Uh, and they interpret what they interpret the way they interpret it. Either Bishop Henry McNeil Turner down in Georgia back in the turn of the uh, late 19th century and uh, early 20th century. He advocated for self-defense. He believed in guns. Uh, Robert Charles was a supporter of Bishop Turner. He was a follower of Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. Uh, he believed that we should go back to Africa. This is before Garvey came on the scene. You understand? So they, he advocated God was black and then black folks had a right to protect themselves. So when I see black folks, you know, not trying to protect themselves and what we got to stop doing, stop forgiving these devils in public spaces. I don't want to hear about, no, we forgive you and we're going to hug you. This is why they doing this to us because they know what's wrong with these people. That's why they're afraid of us. Because they know that if it was them in that position, they'll be forgiving nobody. They'll be killing not only you, they'll kill your whole legacies, man. That's how they do they how they do each other. They're not gonna just kill JFK Sr. They're gonna kill JFK Jr. They're not gonna just gonna kill Malcolm X, they're gonna kill his grandson. They kill legacies, man. So they say, man, we don't understand these people. These people forgive us how we do them. Think about Dylan Roof, right? I'm gonna wrap it up. And I'm going to come back and do a part two, three, four, five, and six. Because I want to thank everybody for really, I'm a surprise at the support we're getting. Because we're really getting shadow banned. But think about Dylan Roof. I approached the five year anniversary of uh, the Charleston Massacre, of uh, Mother Emanuel Church Massacre. This man was caught. He just killed nine people, but nine black people. So he was caught in Shelby, North Carolina. The devils took him. To Burger King, job well done. You deserve a whopper. Make it a double. They rewarded this guy with a Burger King meal. And you know where they caught him at? Shelby, North Carolina, is the birthplace of Thomas Dixon. Look it up. Thomas Dixon wrote the book Klansman, which led to the movie Birth of a Nation. So the birth of a nation was based on the Klansman and he was a college classmate and close friend of Woodrow Wilson who became the president of the United States. I believe they either were classmates at Wake Forest or at John Hopkins in Baltimore. But also uh, Thomas Dixon was a well-known evangelist. He had a large following. He you know, uh, he used to preach in New York. I believe Theodore Roosevelt was one of his uh, people that followed him. But the significance of that, and I'm the only one that I know of. I pointed it out five years ago. I don't see nobody, all y'all, you know, black news people. Y'all talking about the Rhodesia thing, but y'all not talking about the fact that the man was caught in Shelby, North Carolina, the birthplace of Thomas Dixon, the author of the Klansman, which led to the movie Birth of a Nation, which led to the resurgence of the Klan. Like Woodrow Wilson said, it was like writing history with lightning. lightning. And he showed it in the White House. This is a friend, you know, book that led to this movie. And is it a coincidence? Uh, is it interesting that now we have a resurgence of white nationalism? And now you see, you know, the FBI did their report about, you know, how they infiltrated law enforcement. They always been law enforcement. I just told you about it. They Isaac Woodard. They poke his eyes out. This man was a, a veteran and a hero. And he came home. He survived all that stuff overseas only to get his eyes gouged out. Just for being a black man who, you know, when the bus driver tried to disrespect him, he was being respectful and said, look, man, this, uh, you know, I'm in my, you know, I, I served this country. I remember talking to my grandfather. Uh, he's gone now. Be gone for almost 15 years this August 12th. And um, he told me what hurt him was that he was full uniform. When he came back home on the train. One of the first people to call him boy was a 80 year old black man. Here's man. He survived World War II. Mississippian and one of the first people to call him uh, a boy was an 80 year old black man but the 80 year old black man in the eyes of the white man is a boy too see we're not allowed to be men man this, we, black people are in the state of arrested development right now they don't allow we all got the baby girl baby boy complex we're not allowed to grow into maturity look how they kill our leaders man they're not allowed to grow old they're not allowed to even make it to 40 man and we were romanticized and all this BS then we still want to break bread with the enemy, man. We don't even understand who the enemy is. The enemy is the person that will not tell you who you really are. 
you know, if you trust them for your education, for knowledge and stuff, all this stuff should be coming from home. The only thing about the so-called education system should teach you about this reading, writing, and arithmetic. This stuff to help you navigate the system. All the stuff that gives you confidence in life, you get that from home. All the things that help create a foundation for you to stand on, to be proud, to have a moral compass, you to get that at home. The stuff that I'm talking about in this podcast uh, episode, this is stuff that you probably be growing up with. Now, I was blessed that um, I talked to elders in my family from Mississippi. I'm in Memphis. So they all came out of Mississippi. They told me about Emmett Till. I knew about Emmett Till not because they were talking about it in school, but because I talked to Uncle Junebug or my mom or, or anybody. Then my family told me about it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is elementary. You know, and I, my grandma had this Black History World Book Encyclopedia from the 70s. So I was just dive into that. So I would know about Burt Williams and Paul Robeson and Josephine Baker and uh, Fort Pillow Massacre. I grew up with this stuff because I had a, 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 a an intellectual curiosity. I didn't get this from school. I was blessed that my family did think enough of a value of knowledge that my grandma just had that world book encyclopedia right there for me to devour. And also when I was in uh, elementary, I would normally, when we go to the library, when everybody else was checking out books by Winnie the Pooh, and so I was checking out books by Andrew Jackson. I was studying people biography because I was curious about what made people great. You know, I remember when I, even when I was not making the honor roll in third grade, people thought I was the smartest person. Cause they say like, you know, cause one white guy thought I was my friend. He said, he's not smarter than me. I make honor roll. Then somebody said, but yeah, he know about the presidents. <laughs> Is it? He might not make the honor roll, but he know a lot about these presidents. So, I mean, that's me. So I'm, I'm always been different. Okay. So now I'm trying to just make my peace with it being creatively maladjusted. And I wear that as a badge for honor. So. I uh, just want to give y'all this information. But we're going to continue this. But, uh, man, that, that thing hurt me, man. Like, to see that man struggle like that. He got a six-year-old daughter. He got little kids. His oldest child is just six years old. And she's not going to be there. And she's going to be able to, like, she's going to be traumatized. Because that, that image, that video will be out there forever. That's for posterity. You can't remove that. It's already out there in the universe. It's going to be replicated and repeated. And um, this is not fun. And black folks got to realize that, you know, it's not worth having white allies if they can't support you when you need their support. You know, the greatest white man America ever produced, in my opinion, was John Brown. And majority of white folks think he's crazy. Even though he did the right thing. But like he acknowledged in his last words, if I was doing this on behalf of white people and the white elite uh, in terms of fighting, I would be your freedom fighter, basically. You know, I'm a terrorist because I'm doing this to liberate black people. But if I was working on behalf of the money interest, I'd be a damn hero. Look at all these movies and books about John Brown over the years. It's all this miseducation. Then they got this, what, Showtime? Somebody got a series coming out or was out about John Brown. I'm not too eager to look at it. Got some type of, allegedly some cross-dressing black teenager. Trans, t I mean, he wasn't, the stuff, LGBTQ, IA, those alphabet words did not exist. He was about trying to liberate black folks. He didn't go around, well, I want them to wear dresses. I don't care if they're man or woman, they can wear a dress. I'm going to die for that. He didn't die for that. He died for trying to liberate black people. This man sacrificed sons for black people, right? Man was so committed to liberty. He scared Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, man, I, I know. He, Frederick Douglass said to himself, he said, I could, I could live for the Negro. I can fight for the Negro. But I can't die for, the, I can't die for you Negroes. <laughs> But John Brown died for the Negroes. They were trying to break out John Brown. I said, John Brown said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to die. Because I'm going to have to make a, an example that the only way this country was going to change is through bloodshed. Ain't no such thing as a bloodless revolution. I think it's a joke when I'm watching people protesting. Ain't no such thing as no peaceful protest. Ain't no such thing as getting a, per, a permit to protest. When you get a permit to protest, it becomes a parade. Ain't no such thing as a peaceful revolution. This country was not made through peace. This country was made through bloodshed. You got to make a sacrifice. Even Jesus was blood sacrifice. He, he died a violent death. You know, you got to make sacrifices. But the sad thing about it is, a lot of us are afraid, but they're killing you anyway. It's like they're killing you with the so-called medicine, sin, these, uh, you know, stuff they make in the lab. They got all types of weird side effects, even your food. They put non-food products in food products. They uh, poison our water. You know, guys drinking plastic bottles that got toxins in them is leaking into the water. 
so it's counterproductive. Uh, you got the air, not only just chemtrails, all types of stuff. They have ruined the ecosystem so that a small group of people can make some money off the majority of the world's misery. And people talking about buildings getting burnt down, but people don't give a damn about black folks getting stuffed out with their civil and human rights violated. And they're going to have to change because I just can't imagine. Lord knows, no, I can't, whatever y'all call Lord and God, I cannot imagine if I, if I start having children and I try to invest in my children and give them the best of life and you're going to tell me that I should be okay if they get pulled over for going over the speed limit by five miles, they might lose their life. You got to be okay. That I'm supposed to forgive a person uh, who took my seat away. Uh, I'm supposed to hug them and kiss them. We all make up and we all go to church together. We all grow. No, sir. No, sir. That's a disrespect to the ancestors. I just told you about these black men. Came over and they had their uniforms on. And they came home to be lynched. It's like Final Destination. You survive the bombs. It's a machine gun, you come on, you get lynched. In your uniform. And y'all talking about, you know, well, we can't talk about Michael Johnson. We can't talk about uh, Mark Essex. We can't talk about Gavin Long. These guys had all type of PTSD. Dealing with white folks, white man's army. Think about the three first black graduates of West Point. Uh, Henry O. Flipper. John H. Alexander. And Charles Young. The hell they caught. They destroyed Henry O. Flipper's career. They blackballed him. They lied on him. And then it took Bill Clinton. Yes, that Bill Clinton, your, black, your first black president. He exonerated Henry O. Flipper back in the 90s, but he was already dead. He lived the majority of his life in disgrace over some BS. Charles Young, premature death. John Alexander, premature death. Man died in his 30s, man. So... I drop names. See, do I do? Who else doing this, man? Who else doing this? What other black new names? I mean, there's a lot of good ones out there. But who, else, who dropping these names like this? So now I want y'all to go research this stuff and prove that I'm wrong. And like I said, I'm going to do more. You be, well, he ain't talking too much about George Floyd. I'm just letting you know. This be happy. Like when people say, well, why ain't you talking about Breonna Taylor? Because there's no video of it. But thank God that people acknowledging the sister losing her life. That was totally wrong. Imagine you coming home from the military overseas. You just got through fighting Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. Imagine you coming home. Times. She closed police. Sign some corruption to me. Sorry, they were looking for a bag. They were looking for something. And they just come in there. Even the neighbor said they didn't announce themselves. So you had these guys as a hit, a hit squad. Coming somebody home 1.30 in the morning with no knock raid. Brother Kenneth Walker shot back. It's amazing that he survived, even after surrendering his firearm. They could have killed him. Say, hey, you know, they could have. They could have Fred Hampton him, and then they write the narrative saying this guy was, you know, was no good guy. Then got people got the nerves with this media trying to find dirt on people. This woman was an EMT, uh, aspiring to be a nurse, a registered nurse, from my understanding. Twenty six years old, good sister, no criminal record. Even her man didn't have no criminal record. You know what I'm saying? I think all we, we thugs and criminals and stuff. And so they end up dismissing the charges. But then like the, the police union, all them trying to say, well, no, he shot an officer. But he shot the guy in the leg. And he didn't know he was police until they announced themselves as police after killing his woman. And to me, it would have been justified killing some of them. That's ridiculous, man. But it's not just about George Floyd. It's about Alton Sterling. It's about Sandra Bland. It's about everybody. Tamir Rice. It's about John Crawford. It's about so many brothers and sisters we don't even know the name of. Go all the way back. Sam Holes. Jesse Washington. All of them. Thomas Moss. People's Grocery Lynching. Lynch. No, don't you know that most of the majority of the black folks lynched were uh, business owners? Like the people's grocery lynchings. Ida B. Wells' best friend, Thomas Moss, and his two business partners horribly lynched because they were successful at, at being grocers, the people's grocery store. Um, so, okay, family, I'm going to wrap it up for this segment, but we'll come back and I'll have some more to talk about. Thank you all for supporting uh, the We All Be movement because knowledge is the currency of the universe. Feel free to subscribe. Um, we all be TV, YouTube. Also, feel free to donate. K 
Cash App, dollar sign R2C2H2, Venmo at R2C2H2, PayPal R2C2H2 at gmail.com. Also join Patreon.com forward slash We All BTV. Uh, buy Art of His Art, R2C2H2.com. Art of His Gear, go to the link, the shelf down below the video. Click that, look at the latest gear you can wear. This is the Nipsey on the line. The Crenshaw line. The line of Crenshaw, baby. And what about Nipsey? People forgot about Nipsey. What's going on with that case, man? See how they distract us with stuff? We don't even have any type of thing. We don't even understand what's going on with the Nipsey Hustle situation. And that's it. And it's still suspect. That I believe, but I really do believe they killed him for his real estate. It's LA Confidential. So anyway, thank you, family. And the words great to Gelton. We love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing. One love. Everybody, this is Brother Ron. I am asking you all to do me a big favor. Think about supporting the We All Be movement. Your donation is tax deductible. The We All Be Group Incorporated is a recognized 501c3. And I'm just asking you all because I want to keep on bringing y'all quality work uh, through the way that I know how to do best. And uh, I'm going to sing my praises and toot my horn. A lot of y'all were not hip to Dick Gregory until Brother Ron brought him on the We All Be platform, until that Django review we did. Y'all seen another side of Judge Joe Brown, and Judge Joe Brown's message has been amplified. But it was We All Be that brought Judge Joe Brown to y'all back in 2014. And so many others, and we covered so many things. So help us out so we can help you all. Peace. <laughs>